And uh, again, this is for parallel programming. And you probably already know what that is. Have we done everything here? Yep, I think so. Oh, that's kind of interesting. The total power of the thing is 70 watts. Each board is about 4.2 watts. So an Apple IIe does not use much power. It really doesn't. The power that an Apple IIe consumes is all in its plug-in boards. And so if a, if a power supply doesn't is not sufficient for a IIe uh, with the cards unplugged, then it is well and truly dead. <coughs> Uh, and on the other hand, if, you, if you, you can plug in a bunch of stuff and you can basically add up the power of the cards, add 4.2 watts, and that's what you're demanding to the power supply. Um, okay, I think we did everything else. Oh, I still have the get ID chain. I like that idea of daisy chaining the machines to get the IDs assigned, right? And the point of all this was to support parallel programming. Uh, so this, is, uh, this not only makes lights go up and down, it also allows you to write programs that run in parallel, and, and that, in fact, that the one that runs lights up and down was done in about an hour. Uh, I mean, it was done and debugged and packaged and cleaned up in about an hour. So it isn't hard to do parallel programs if you provide yourself with some reasonable tools. Uh, the first tool, of course, is not a net, which I'm kind of taking for granted in all of this. That provides an ampersand extension to AppleSoft for peeking and poking arbitrary blobs of memory from from my memory to any memory, any the machine, uh, the memory of any machine it's serving. Not a net is not an interrupt driven network. It's completely pulled. So if you're not serving, nothing, nobody on the network is going to disturb you. You're not there unless you're listening. So it means anything, any board that is planning to do something with not a net is going to be contacted regular regularly. Needs to be listening regularly. Now, when you try to contact a board, it keep, will keep trying to contact it for about three or four seconds. And if it doesn't serve within three or four seconds, then it assumes that it's gone dead somehow. It's not going to work. It times out. Um, you can change that, by the way, but that's the default. And the, so the, that means that when you write a program that's going to be uh, going to be communicating with things, you have to think about that, about how communication is going to work. If you've got two guys who are randomly trying to talk to each other at random times and computing other times, then you can pretty well guarantee it isn't going to work because <coughs> when this guy wants to talk, this guy's not going to be listening. Now that brings up the concept of a message server, which is always listening. Conventionally, I choose machine number two as a message server just because it's handy to have a destination number that's constant. So if I'm using a message server, machine two is actually always listening and it's always serving requests. And the two requests that are most important that it serves are get message, put message. So if somebody puts a message, they can put a message up to 255 bytes into the message server in a, in a queue that has a 16-bit name. Uh, obviously, the memory of the thing can't hold anywhere near the number of messages, but it doesn't matter if you're a big namespace. And get message uh, will pull a message out, given the queue number. It'll give you the first, the first message in that queue. Is that the basis of your IAM protocol? Yeah, as it, is, it certainly is. Exactly. <laughs> so it implements, it implements a set of FIFO queues. And uh, it's always listening, so it means that people can talk with each other without having to worry about timing. So I can asynchronously send messages to whoever I want to, and asynchronously they can go get the message whenever they want to. And they never have to be serving at all. They just need to talk to the message. Server. So that's, uh, that's handy. So when you're doing parallel programming, you're, the, what you're trying to achieve is get as many things working simultaneously as possible so that the total amount of time required to, uh, to finish the problem is reduced. And to do that, you've got to decompose the program into parts, obviously. And the trick is that, by the way, <laughs> that's easy to say. It's harder to do, uh, mostly. Because you have to, each part has to do enough computation so that the business of getting it started and getting a result doesn't take longer than doing the computation. Right? If, you, if that were the case, you'd spend more time communicating than computing. They also have to be sufficiently independent so that even if they take a long time, they have to be relatively independent of each other so they don't have to spend all their time coordinating with other people about data they happen to be working on. That's another way to die. And finally, it doesn't help if you've got 99% of the program reduced into little pieces if the last 1% takes an hour and a half. But it's still going to take an hour and a half. So the longest sequential piece is going to dominate. So you have to, have to watch all of that stuff. Now there's several different, there are actually this is like trying to categorize uh, like living things. I mean, there are a whole lot of different ways.
ways to categorize. But these are some useful ones that are big top level categories. We can think of these as the sort of the kingdom level. Um, so pipeline parallelism is a, is a very handy structured kind of parallelism. It's, uh, you can think of it as being like an assembly line because you divide the processing you want to do up into a lot of little chunks. But they're all about, they all take about the same time to complete because they will take the same amount of time to complete. If one guy finishes early, he has to wait for the next guy anyway. So, so whoever's slowest, that's the time it's going to take to advance the pipeline. Uh, each one can be done essentially independently, so I don't need to communicate with anybody else while I'm doing my piece of work. And the trick, the proof, of course, is making that be true. Like, it's not bringing in the pieces that actually are reasonably uh, comparable in time. Because whichever one is slowest, that's the speed at which the pipeline advances. And it will do exactly one chunk in whatever the slowest time the pipeline stage is. And if anything happens in, the, in, the pipe, in this pipeline to break down anything, the whole pipeline stops. There's no queuing. Well, there's a kind of silly queuing, in the, one level queuing, in the sense that this guy uh, won't accept a result until he's finished and he's passed his result on. So it's kind of backward queuing. When this guy finishes, he passes his stuff out, and then he can accept the thing, the work from here. And he can accept it, he can accept it, he can like that. Right. So it kind of ripples. Uh, but when it's all working properly, it ripples very nicely. 